Hello, welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Young Gil Kim. North Korean leader Kim Jong Un continues to call for strengthening the self-reliance, saying the country cannot wait until all circumstances are met. Many analysts say the North Korean economy cannot survive on the self-reliance alone, and although sanctions relief is much needed for the economic growth, the North Korean regime apparently continues on with its nuclear activities. Today, we'll discuss these and more. Joining me is William Newcomb, fellow at the Center for Advanced Defense Studies. Mr. Newcomb was a member of the panel of experts on North Korea sanctions at the United Nations. He also served as deputy coordinator of the U.S. State Department's North Korea Working Group. Joshua Stanton is also with me today. Mr. Stanton is a lawyer in Washington, D.C. He has helped the U.S. Congress draft numerous North Korea sanctions bills and laws. His blog, FreeKorea.us focuses on North Korea sanctions and other related issues. Welcome to the program. Good to have you both today. Thank you for bringing us on. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you, Liz and Josh. Mr. Newcomb, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un keeps talking about how the self-reliance is important for the country to build up its economy. Do you think this is realistic? Uh, absolutely not. If you look at North Korea's economic history, self-reliance, Juche, has never worked. They were highly dependent in the old days upon uh, aid from the Soviet Union. Uh, later on, aid from China. Uh, they were dependent upon uh, creating deals in the West that they never repaid. Um, and if you go back and look at the whole notion of self-reliance, um, it was uh, popularized by a fellow, an economist named Raoul Prebish, uh, and wherever it was tried, it never worked. So even in the absence of sanctions, North Korea would need to find a different path, but throughout its history, it's never shown a willingness to do so. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stanton, the North Korean regime must know they cannot go on like this, don't they? Uh, look, if North Korea doesn't need a lot of cash to sustain its economy at the level that it was running, say, five or six years ago, and if it gets $100, it really only prioritizes the last $10 that pay for Kim Jong-un's palaces. Uh, he's in the middle of a palace building spree right now. Uh, his WMD programs, his security forces, and then feeding his military. So you really have to get to the last $10 to change his calculus, and you have to target the sanctions toward the, 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 the bank accounts and the trading companies and the front companies that, that provide that last $10. That's where we should be focusing instead of broader sanctions uh, that have dual impacts. Uh, but it, look, sanctions have a half-life. They deteriorate quickly. And for every group that we designate, uh, the North Koreans have agents in Hong Kong and Macau who are setting up new shell companies and front companies we haven't done a single North Korea designation for almost a year now, and we've done very few since the Singapore summit. Sanctions don't work if you don't enforce them. And because we're not enforcing them, Kim Jong-un may think that he can simply muddle through until the moment of political opportunity is right for him. Some people argue that sanctions were not effective in preventing North Korea from further developing its nuclear and missile programs. So you're saying is that the North Korean sanctions were not effective because it's not strictly enforced, Mr. Stanton? That is exactly what I'm saying. And in particular, they were not enforced against China in particular, and also Russia, and then finally some entities in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia and Singapore, that have been helping North Korea launder money more or less willfully, more willfully in the case of China, maybe a little more negligently in the case of Malaysia and Singapore. But this gets back to the history that Mr. Newcomb started to tell us about. North Korea had very little exposure to the financial uh, system uh, before 1993 when it was a part of the Soviet trading bloc called the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance. When that aid collapsed and disappeared, then it, it suddenly realized that it needed that access 
It negotiated that in 1995. President Clinton uh, published a regulation giving North Korea access to dollar clearing through our banking system. And instead of taking that opportunity to reform and to open and to change, North Korea continued to counterfeit currency, deal drugs, proliferate, and uh, be the world's uh, you know, least scrupulous arms dealer. They have been offered many opportunities to change their calculus, and so far we have not, will- we have not been willing to enforce consistently and steadily enough to change the way Pyongyang thinks. Mr. Newcomb, what is your thought on this? The sanctions were not able to work in changing the regime's behavior because it's not fully implemented? Well, certainly I concur with just everything Josh has been saying. Um, Sanctions are the most powerful non-kinetic tool at the disposal of the international community. But if they're not enforced rigorously, then as Josh says, they have a, they're, they're hard to enforce, right? They're expensive to enforce. And if they're not enforced, then what you have is um, a system where we're squandering um, opportunity to drive North Korea to the negotiating table. And this has been true, not just recently, not, not just under the last couple of administrations. Uh, it's been true ever since the first UN sanctions uh, were imposed in, in 2006. Every administration that we've had in the U.S. has had uh, some uh, well-intended policies and some grievous error of policy. Um, so it, it, this is not something that's, that's partisan politics. And truly, it's up to the U.S. and the like-minded countries to uh, create the political will in other countries to enforce these sanctions. That's the only way we'll get North Korea to the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. Sanctions are not designed to eliminate the program. They're designed to bring about negotiations that will eliminate the programs. But there are some people say the sanctions need to be eased in order to enhance the livelihood of the civilian population. Even in the United States, there are some calls from Congress the Biden administration should review the sanctions that are affecting humanitarian efforts in North Korea. Uh, Mr. Newcomb, what do you say to that? Well, this is not new. When I (laughs) served on the panel, Russia and China raised exactly the same kind of concerns about the humanitarian impact of sanctions. We examine them. You cannot disentangle uh, the effects of unilateral sanctions and the multilateral UN or EU type sanctions. Uh, Furthermore, uh, one part of the sanctions is financial and banks concern about reputational risk causes them to boycott trade with North Korea. So you have this this further uh, obstacle that um, develops in terms of um, the humanitarian angle. And let's face it, both Moscow and Beijing have never been known to be compassionate. So their objectives in this is not to relieve the, the, what they call the suffering of the North Korean populace. They have political objectives in mind. I believe they are concerned about the fragility of the North Korean economy at this time and, and have growing concern about some kind of an implosion. Whether this is correct or not, I can, I can only speculate. Uh, but I am pretty confident that humanitarian reasons aren't driving their concerns. Mm-hmm. In terms of the U.S., Uh, I don't think it's so much policies now that are preventing uh, humanitarian aid from getting through. There was a time when it was very tough, but now I think it's a little bit easier. The the blockage comes at the North Korean border with its COVID restrictions. The blockage, again, comes through financial channels where banks just aren't willing to deal with anything involving North Korea.
The the sanctions regulations at 31 CFR 510.512 and 510.514 specifically exclude the activities of NGOs and international organizations. Uh, Section 208 of the North Korea Sanctions and Policy Enhancement Act excludes uh, humanitarian aid from the sanctions. Look, the problem with food getting into North Korea is that the government of North Korea has imposed a blockade and maintained it for about two years now. Uh, We can't completely disaggregate the effects of the blockade from the effects of sanctions, but it's pretty clear that the effects of the blockade are much greater. What effects did we see on the civilian population before the blockade? I would say that there were probably some measurable effects on the civilian population in Jagang province, where the arms industry is, and in South Pyongan province, where the coal industry works. Well, affecting the munitions industry is not an unintended consequence, and we also know that the coal industry pays for North Korea's WMD programs and its missiles in particular. The answer to that is to deliver humanitarian aid to those people because we're not trying to starve them, but the government of North Korea, again, will not let us deliver food to North Korea. It has expelled most diplomats, pretty much all humanitarian aid workers, and it has never been transparent in allowing UN monitors to give food to those who need it. The unfortunate fact is that all of us on this program and who are watching it care more about the people of North Korea than its own government does. And the IAEA has recently found there are indications of 5 megawatts reactor operating at Yongbyon. Mr. Stanton, doesn't this give more reason to the international community not to ease sanctions on North Korea? Well, I think so, but it also gives us, again, reason to enforce them better. We have to understand, and this again goes back to what Mr. Newcomb has said about the history. Before 2017, the sanctions against North Korea were an effective nullity. And what we have never seen is a campaign like the one that we targeted against Iran, where there were massive penalties, nine and 10 digits in dollars, where we went after the banks that were laundering money for Iran. This eventually caused Iran to come back to the bargaining table and negotiate the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And uh, what we need is something similar with regard to the banks that are laundering North Korea's money, mostly in China, to some extent in Russia, uh, that are making it uh, such that Kim Jong-un thinks that time is on his side. When he concludes that time is not on his side, he will come back to negotiate. And what we have seen with North Korea is a pattern that when he is muddling along just fine, he isolates himself. But when he is under pressure, he suddenly gains newfound interest in summits and diplomacy and getting out into the world uh, to uh, talk with uh, Donald Trump or, or Moon Jae-in to get sanctions relaxed. Mr. Newcomb, China and Russia are often called out for not complying with the UN Security Council resolutions. And right now, they're calling for easing sanctions at the security. Uh, how is realistically, if we assume that it's not easy to get cooperation from China and Russia at this moment, is there any way that we can make sanctions more effective? Well, yes. Uh, One, the like-minded can be more uh, vigorous in uh, going after sanctions violators. Two, uh, in the financial community, a lot of compliance is uh, hit or miss. It's done on basis of lists and so forth. Um, You can see the evidence uh, in uh, some U.S. banks that have processed uh, North Korean transactions. Um, So... Yeah, we can we can do a, a better job. Uh, we can encourage the weak-willed countries, and I include Malaysia in this list, uh, to go after the North Korean companies that are operating in their territory and shut them down. Um, we can put pressure on Russia and China in terms of uh, North Korean labor producing goods there and just 
uh, say it, it won't be accepted in international commerce. We can continue to uh, lobby Moscow and Beijing to do a better job enforcing and expose where they are not, particularly in the oil trade. We can go after Taiwan, uh, which is allowing companies based there uh, to participate in this um, offshore oil trade that's supplying North Korea clandestinely. We could perhaps be more vigorous at sea and start trying to disrupt these transfers rather than just witness them with uh, and publish photography. Um, I mean, all of these things also take political will in Washington, and I have seen very little of that. Mm-hmm. I think that if, if we could do just one thing to have the most payoff at the least cost, it would be financial enforcement. Look, patrolling the seas around North Korea is a very difficult job. It comes with risks. And there are a lot of uh, diplomatic trade-offs that we have to make to to get that to happen. And at the end, we're not going to be able to cut off maritime trade between North Korea and China. We we have had some success and could have much more success if we were to pursue banks like the Bank of China and Shanghai Pudong, which we know have been conduits for money laundering between China and North Korea. Uh, the case that we need to continue to watch is uh, the the case of three subpoenas against Chinese banks. Two of those banks are unknown because those subpoenas are under seal. And whatever the prosecutors in the FBI find in those subpoena returns could be critical in causing the Chinese banking system to realize that there are costs to undermining sanctions. If I could add. Um Also, the seizure of ships sends a very pointed message to the ship owners that are allowing uh, their vessels to participate in some of this uh, clandestine trade. And it's been done successfully, and I think we could use a little bit more of that. Otherwise, I fully support what Josh is saying about finance. Finance is such a powerful, powerful tool. It's the most powerful one at the disposal of the U.S. Right. My last question for today, both of you mentioned the U.S. has not been pushing enough so that the sanctions could be for fully implemented. Why do you think that was the case? And what is, is there anything the U.S. can do at this stage, Mr. Newcomb? North Korea is focused on episodically, uh, from what I can tell. And administrations respond either to pressure, provocation, um, or, or the like. I can only speculate. I don't have the kind of contacts I used to have. I'm retired. But I can only uh, assume that the administration is trying to focus on other things because it doesn't see much progress uh, to be made at this time uh, on, on North Korea's uh, activities. Um, but certainly I agree with Josh. Let's, let's get enforcement uh, back up on the agenda. Um, I'm a little concerned about some of the pressure I see being uh, levied on Congress for relaxation. It's, uh, again, I think a lack of due diligence on the part of some representatives and their staff to look at uh, the uh, organizations that are pushing this message. And uh, Mr. Stanton, what choice is left for the U.S.? Um, Look, uh, I think the point that we just have to understand is that we have never seen this thing called maximum pressure with regard to North Korea. Uh, This is the one Donald Trump bumper sticker that no journalist was ever willing to fact check. What we saw was a period up to 2017 when the sanctions were effectively nothing. North Korea laughed them off. For a brief period until mid-2018, we had a period of uh, rapid designations, but never any serious civil penalties. Uh, And those civil penalties are critical in changing the way the banks think about North Korean risk. But I would only call that medium pressure. And then after Singapore in mid-2018, they fell off to nothing, to the point where we're doing Nicaragua designations and, and Venezuela designations, but we're not designating targets in North Korea. Now, without commenting on Nicaragua or Venezuela, I would say that North Korea presents the far greater threat to the peace of the world 
and certainly to its own people. Uh, sanctions don't work if you don't enforce them. Uh, we have got to enforce the sanctions if we're going to change Kim Jong-un's calculus and disarm him peacefully. If I may. Yes, go ahead. It goes beyond North Korea. If North Korea is allowed to persist and get away with its nuclear and ballistic missile programs, what will be the consequences? Number one, sanctions have their teeth pulled in the future because um, those states, those countries that have uh, ambition or potential of being nuclear breakout states can only be encouraged by this. Plus, those in the region that are concerned about their own security and now realize the lack of U.S. pressure affecting North Korea, well, what's Japan going to do? What eventually might South Korea do? What would Taiwan do? And then more broadly, how about Saudi Arabia? Iran certainly will be encouraged to go full steam ahead. And it even gets into this hemisphere with Brazil. So, you know, I, I see failure on denuclearizing North Korea as having much bigger consequences over time. A, a country that built a nuclear reactor in Syria, sold manned portable surface-to-air missiles to Iranian-backed terrorists, and then finally used VX nerve agent in a crowded airport terminal in Malaysia, and is increasingly gaining nuclear hegemony over South Korea, is not just a North Korea problem. Meanwhile, South Korea's government officials said they're closely monitoring the possibility of North Korea holding an event at the end of November celebrating its launch of an intercontinental ballistic missile four years ago. North Korea continuously claims the U.S. and South Korea for creating a hostile environment, but their statements and actions seem to be hostile. Mr. Newcomb and Mr. Stanton, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for having us. And that does it for this week's Washington Talk from Voice of America. Please join us again next week for more analysis. Mm -hmm.